Welcome to Means of Grace, a podcast produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. Tis the season for celebration, especially in the church, but even more broadly in our culture today. But what if you're experiencing the opposite emotion, sadness and grief in this time of great joy? The contrast can feel jarring. I'm Melissa McGill, the Conference Director of Communications. On this episode of Means of Grace, we're talking with the Reverend Tony Ruth Smith about grief at Christmas. Welcome, Tony Ruth. Can you share a little bit about who you are? Thanks, Melissa. I'm real happy to be here. Um, Yeah, my name is Tony Ruth Smith. I am the co-pastor of Harrisburg United Methodist Church in Harrisburg, just outside of Concord, um, with my husband, Wesley Smith, and we've been there for eight years now. And um, this topic is particularly important to me, and I... um, you know, we at, we at Harrisburg a couple of years ago decided we wanted to start doing a Blue Christmas service in part because we felt like we needed to identify some of this. So I'm really happy to be here to talk to you about it and um, see how we can maybe spread the word about why it's important in our churches. Yeah, that's awesome. So recently I read an article on grief and one line really resonated with me. It says there's a gulf between mourners and the rest of the world. In your opinion, how is this true, especially during the holidays? And maybe that's why you started. Why did y'all start the service? So I think um, that around the holidays, I think we are prone to be people that wear masks anyway, um, to hide our struggles and to hide our grief and to hide the, the things we're going through. I think people do that in general. But I think the temptation to do it during the holidays is even greater for most people. And I think part of that's because, you know, you turn on, you know, K104.7 and everything's, it's a holly jolly Christmas and it's the most wonderful time of the year. And Mm -hmm. if you are not feeling those things, you really feel like you're swimming against the tide of the culture. And so you kind of don't want to be the Debbie Downer in the room. (laughs) So you don't talk about the things where you're sad or you're grieving or you're missing someone or things aren't great for you. Um, Maybe you're going through a depression. Um, Maybe you've moved and everything has changed. So I think a lot of people, when they're feeling those things at the holidays, have a a real strong urge to just sort of hide it all. And what that does is in the darkness, these things grow and thrive in us as opposed to um, allowing what Christmas is really about to invade those places where we're feeling that way. And fill them up with some hope, which I think is why Jesus came anyway. And so I think when the church doesn't identify those things, when it doesn't acknowledge that that's happening, um, here's this place where we're supposed to be the most real, where we're supposed to be authentic, where we're supposed to bring our truest self. And where we are told that God loves us and God comforts the grieving and um, he lifts up those who are sorrowful. And we don't feel like we can bring that to church. And so for churches to give people the opportunity to name it, and be honest about it and be real about it in a safe way, I think um, allows people to experience more of um, the presence of Christ, which is what the season of Advent and Christmas really ought to be about for us. So um, for me, that comes out of um, my own personal experience of the holidays. So um, when I was five years old, my father passed away in an accident um, three weeks before Christmas. And so I don't have a lot of memory necessarily of that time, but for my family, there's always sort of been this little pallor over the holidays um, of knowing someone's not there that should be there. And um, when I had my own children and um, started watching them grow, that sense of loss for me has um, sort of compounded for me. And so I went through a, a really hard season. Um, of several Christmases where I found myself really doing the hiding thing (laughs) and uh, thinking if I could buy everybody the best present and make everything perfect and decorate the perfect tree and have the, the, the Norman Rockwell painting, um, that I could sort of hide the sense of sadness that's there, the sense of loss that's there, um, and the inevitability of thinking about what my first Christmas without my dad must have been like. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely identify with that feeling. And I'll never forget, um, that's probably four or five years ago on Christmas morning. And we had opened all the presents and, um, I went outside to like, you know, take out the trash that we had accumulated inevitably. And, um, and I, the sun was rising because, you know, I have children. It was early. And um, 
my husband's truck was parked right there and the bed was down and I sat down on the bed of the truck and I just sat there and cried and I had gotten everything that I wanted and my kids were so happy. And that realization that nothing could give me the thing I most wanted was there and I had been burying it. And so it was after that, that I was like, okay, we got to do something. I have to do something different. I can't keep doing it this way. But we as a church have got to do something different because I know I can't be the only one that's feeling that way. So for me, that's where it came from. And, you know, I'm feeling good this year. I'm not, you know, I don't think you're going to feel that every time. But I certainly think that naming it and being real about it Mm -hmm. is really important um, to letting Christ redeem and heal the places that we feel most broken and hurting. Thanks so much for sharing that. Sure. And especially for you as a pastor, you have a third element in there as well. Not only the personal experience of being at church with Mm -hmm. Holly Jolly, but also it's a crazy busy work time for you in the church too. How have you balanced that, especially in those years near this realization? Um, yeah, for sure. That's true. And I, I I think for me, there's a tendency to overwork and I think we can do that. And I think, I don't think that's just clergy. I think everybody can do that. Like, you know, if I work hard enough, I can bury what I'm feeling. So I think that's part of it. Um, and I think to, um, for me, the my favorite Christmas Eve service is for sure the last one, <laughs> the one that happens at 11 o'clock at night. Um, I do that one at every church I go to, um, mostly for myself, mm-hmm. yeah. because um, there's something really powerful about walking into and out of a church when everything is quiet and all the wrapping is done and all the toys are put together and the kids are in bed and there's just silence. And there's something beautifully holy about that silence for me. Um, so I, for me, that's how I have worked through it is, is that. The other thing for me is there's nothing better than holding up candles and singing Silent Night on Christmas Eve. And uh, I do that standing next to my kids. It's the one service where we get to sit together as a family. You know, we let our kids sit up where the pastors sit. Um, and that last year we did that for the first time. And, man, my kids remember it. Um, and it's important to them. So I think – Finding balance as clergy is just really important, but I don't think that's exclusive to who we are as, as clergy people. The other thing I would say is, man, I I can't statistically state this, but it seems to me that um, I feel like I do more funerals when it's cold weather. Um, and maybe you're just thinking about it more, but I mean, it turned cold and we've already had three. And I'll never forget a Christmas when I was a pastor at a larger church. I was the associate and we did six funerals in the six weeks leading up to Christmas. Wow. And, you know, um, boy, that'll put a power Mm -hmm. over all of it too. And so I think for clergy to be able to sort of acknowledge that that's there and it's happening is really important. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. So tell me about how you guys started this service at your current church. And have you done that in the past? What did you use to get started? So um, we decided we wanted to do a blue Christmas service. I introduced that to them. It was not something that they had done before. And Let me pause you right yeah. there. Let's talk a little bit about what specifically that means. Yeah. Okay. So Blue Christmas, um, some people call it the longest night. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it kind of varies by name. It's all sort of the same concept. And the concept being that Christmas being a time where you where you need to acknowledge that you may be blue, you may be sad, um, and you may be struggling. And as we come toward the longest night piece of that is – you know, the, the scripture that talks about um, my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. And that when things are dark, um, the longing for the light. And so that's really where it comes from. And so whether it's called Blue Christmas or Longest Night, the concept is the same, that you have a service that you specifically do. Some people do them on Sunday morning during worship. That's not something I – I think there's value in it. I think there's value in doing it a different way as well. Um, but – that service is specifically designed to sort of be a place where you can put this feeling. So um, that's what it is, uh, Blue Mm -hmm. Christmas. So we started ours um, because I just felt like it was something I needed and I wanted to offer to other people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's not anything in the book of worship for Blue Christmas that was what I wanted to do. So I just went online and started looking um, and looking at services that had what I was going for. And I think part of what you have to acknowledge in a Blue Christmas service is that – That atmosphere is important. Um, Music is important. The words are important to create um, a safe place where people can feel like it's okay to take off my mask. We were also in the process at Harrisburg of rebooting our Stephen ministry and um, really felt like that Stephen ministry could partner with us in doing that. So our worship committee partnered with our Stephen ministry to do this service together. 
um, for our congregation. So I went online and just started looking and I didn't really find as per usual anything that was exactly what I wanted. So we took um, the one that we liked the best and we just began to adapt it. Um, and I have a great creative team at Harrisburg of people that are, I mean, can make, you know, twigs in a vase look like art. You know what I'm talking about? So um, I'm always jealous of those people. I know, right? I have not this skill. And I'm so thankful that God put me in a church where people have this skill Absolutely. Um, that say, oh, we can do that when I have a crazy idea. What if we did this? And they go, oh, we could totally make that work. Okay. Great. So beautiful. <laughs> Let's do that. So, um, so we were started talking about it together. The one I adapted was actually from, um, young clergy women, um, dot org, which is a, an organization that's young clergy women kind of supporting one another and encouraging one another. And so, um, we pulled that service and then just began to adapt it to our purpose and what we wanted to create. Um, we decided to do it not on a Sunday morning. Um, I think the reason for that is, again, when you're wearing masks, it's going to be really hard to take them off in a big group of people. Mm -hmm. And if you do a targeted thing, I think you get the people that most need and want to be there. And then you're sort of creating the space, the safe space where people feel like they can um, do that. We did ours um, on a Thursday night because it's quiet at our church. We do it when it's dark. Um, and there's not really much else going on. We also try to do it as close to Christmas as we can. Like this year, it's going to be the Thursday before Christmas to, um, I think, cause I think the closer you get to Christmas, the source sort of the, the busy hubbub begins to wind down and you can kind of, you're open to the, to the, to the process and to what this service ought to be. So that's how we found ours. And what I love about it is, um, I think when you're, when you're going through, um, grief and loss or struggle, there's a real power in doing symbolic things. And so that's one of the things that I love best about this service that we did. So um, in our service, uh, we gave people when they came in a strip of muslin. This is where people help are helpful, mm -hmm. not me, but other people. <laughs> we gave people a strip of muslin. And then during the singing of any of the songs, we invited them to go back to a, a table at the back of the sanctuary where we had pens that you can actually write on the muslin. And we invited them to write down whatever it was that brought them there, write the name of a person they were missing or a situation that they're going through or a struggle that's happening in them and not for anybody else. No one was ever going to see this, but them. So we had them write this down on the muslin. And I think that piece is really important. There's something important about giving somebody something symbolic, something tactile, something um, experiential beyond your ears. Um, and there's power in writing it down and seeing it written down in front of you. So we had them do that. And then um, we invited them to come and lay it in the manger. Um, and that's just beautiful. We just had this little bare bones manger. And it it's so powerful. I can't even... I can't even really tell you how powerful it is to go do that, to just lay that in the manger and symbolically laying it with Christ. Um, there's power in that. So that was part of the service. The other part was we had our Stephen ministers circle in the room and um, we invited people after they had put whatever they needed to, or maybe before um, in the manger to go and have somebody pray with them. And um, you just got to let that breathe. Honestly, that's the biggest part of the service was this breathing I think it's important that it's not the clergy that they're talking to. Certainly there are some people that are going to need to talk to their clergy and I'm not discounting that at all. But I think if you have trained people in your church like Stephen ministers or people that have been through lay servant training um, that are safe places for someone to just share and talk and to say, this is where I need somebody to be praying for me. Um, what you could watch from my vantage point at the front of the church when that section of the service is happening is people really opening up and being able to weep or um, to release and let go of something that they've been holding on to. So that I feel like has been a, was a really important part of mm -hmm. the service. So um, the shape of ours is really just sort of a greeting and some leading people into um, naming what's happening and, um, and then giving them time to sit and reflect. And then here's the thing. And this is the most important thing. You want people to leave with hope, not necessarily with joy, because I don't think that you're going to come in in an hour and suddenly you're going to feel holly jolly. Like that's not the end game. The end game is not that they leave with joy. The end game is that they leave with hope. 
And that means reminding people um, why Jesus came into the world. And, and I think if you do this well, I think it really helps people to find that sort of sense of hope. Mm-hmm. I love that. Let's dig a little more deeper into this, the hope and joy at this mm-hmm. season. Like what are the theological right. implications of that? We see that this season isn't just about what are, what culturally we think that it is. Can we unpack that a little bit more? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, for me, um, you know, when we think about Advent tends to have these words attached to it, right? Hope, peace, joy, love. And we tend to focus on one to the exclusion of the others at our own peril. Because I think that joy, um, for most people, and certainly for people that are not in church and aren't versed in theological stuff, joy gets equated with happiness. And and I certainly don't think that's what biblical joy is. Biblical joy has more to do with who God is and um, our understanding of the source of um, contentment and um, rejoicing. Um, and it's not happiness because I think you can feel joy even when you're not happy. Absolutely. But I think when we elevate joy to the exclusion of hope, peace, and love, we're really not getting that balance right. And I think that hope in particular is the important counterbalance. Hope is not prognostication. Hope is not about me predicting what's getting ready to happen in the future. So hope is not about me predicting that out in the future I'm going to feel better all the time and all the things that made me sad are just going to go away. So he says hope is not prognostication. Hope is an orientation of the spirit. It is an orientation of the heart. Man, that's powerful. Hope is an orientation of the spirit. So what does it mean to invite people to feel a sense of hope in the middle of their loss? That that scripture again, that though the night feels like it's so long and it's so dark, there is a light that shines in the darkness and the darkness hasn't overcome it. And no matter how long we feel like we're laying in the darkness, there is still that print prick of hope that's out there. And I think that can help us then to find that sense of peace, which again, doesn't mean the absence of conflict. You know, biblical peace is about shalom, which is about wholeness. Mm -hmm. And wholeness is not something you're going to find under a Christmas tree. There is just literally no present that is going to make you feel peace. Um, But there is wholeness that can be found in Christ. um, And in what Christ has done for us, where we can, he can redeem those losses that we have held for far too long. And, while maybe not make us feel good about them, help us to see how he's redeemed them and he's holding them with us and then love above all things, right? Um, That God loves us in our darkness. God loves us when we're sad. God loves us when things aren't perfect and has no expectation that we should have the Norman Rockwell Christmas in order for us to know what it is to be loved. And so I think when we can sort of find the right balance of those things, then we can know joy. I think everybody thinks about, you know, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Um, and that's great. By all means, we should sing that. Um, but man, there's so much power in, um, you know, come thou long expected Jesus, you know, and waiting for God. And I think when we don't allow ourselves to have Advent, you know, cause there's, there's wisdom in the tradition when we don't allow ourselves to have that Advent waiting, When we skip it, what we're really skipping is hope and peace and love that we all really need. So that's fantastic. Yeah. I was tearing up a little bit when you were saying all of that. I love that. And I let's talk also a little bit about how the church can do that in today's society Mm -hmm. with the divisiveness. Mm -hmm. There's so much wrong in the world. Um We keep, like, when we watch the news, we see all of this grief and pain within our world as well. So how can the church create space for that, Mm -hmm. that we're not pretending like everything's okay and we're acknowledging it with the hope that Christ is coming? Yeah, I think, man, our world right now, right? right? (laughs) And um, I think everybody's holding their breath in about that. You and I, when when, when I just said that, you and I both took a deep breath in and went, and I think everybody's doing that. And I don't care if you're center right, center left, far right, far left. I think everybody's doing this holding my breath thing. I think that when people are grieving, when people are afraid, if you'll watch them, they hold their breath. 
And they're holding the breath because they're waiting for the impact. They're waiting for the next hit. And I think to invite people to take a deep breath and let it go. And to center ourselves in the story of Christ. And to remember that the predominant story of our world is not the story of division or the story of discord. Um, Jesus came into the world to deal with that. And we are people of resurrection. And we need to remember that even at Christmas time. We are people of resurrection. We remember that Jesus came into the world for the purpose of the next thing. So that gets me to something that we at the in our blue Christmas service is something that we did, I think is important. So we had people write on these bands of cloths and they laid them in the manger. And then we read the Christmas story. And if you remember in Luke chapter two, um, describes how Jesus was born in the stable and um, Mary wrapped him in bands of cloth. That's what it says. Yeah. Mary wrapped him in bands of cloth. And it was a powerful thing to stand next to a manger with cloth, bands of cloth that had written on them sorrows. And to read the prophet Isaiah saying he was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering, acquainted with infirmity, and surely he has borne born our infirmities and carried our diseases and borne our sorrows. So to say to people, look, Jesus was born for this. To call him Prince of Peace means he is born for the truth that we are broken and that we don't have wholeness and that we do have conflict and that we are proclaiming in the middle of all that that there was this baby that was born in a manger and he was born for the express purpose of revealing to us the heart of God and dealing with that division. And the world needs that story to counterbalance the. I mean, just ridiculous levels of hatred and deciding that, you know, I can't be like somebody because of whatever they may believe about this or that political or social issue, right? Jesus came for all of that and he came for everybody, mm -hmm. um, for the people that you vehemently disagree with and those people that are very like you. And the truth is the great equalizer for all of those things is that everybody in that scenario, my opinion, of course, is everybody in that scenario is feeling anxiety. Everybody is experiencing loss. Everybody is afraid that they're going to lose something that's quite important to them. And when we can remember that we're not the only one that's losing something, when we can be in worship together and acknowledge everyone's sorrow, man, I think there might actually be hope for us to find a way forward mm -hmm. because we can see our common humanity, our common need for that baby that's born in a manger. So I do think it's, I do believe Jesus to be the hope of the world for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What has been some of the response you've gotten in your congregation to this new service? Y'all have been doing it for a few years now. How are they responding? Um, beautifully. No, I think um, I had so many people, particularly last year, that um, came to us and said, oh, I'm so thankful you did this. There were people that I knew why they were sitting there. You know, the pastor's going to, I know people's stories. So there were people that I knew that they were there. And there were other people that I was like, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Um, there were people that came to that service that were like me, that were talking about uh, the loss of a parent from years and years ago, um, that said, you know, I've just been, I feel this way every year and I'm, and I'm just tired. I'm weary mm -hmm. of holding this in. And thank you so much for giving me a place to put it and to name it. Um, had so many people do that. I also put it on Facebook that we had done it. And I had a friend from high school that said, thank you so much. She said for many years, blue Christmas was the only service my family could go to. Um, because it was the only place that we felt like we could be real. And I think everybody, family knows that season, right? You just know that season. I think back on my own childhood and, um, my, my mother is a woman of great and deep faith and, and we always were church going people, but I never went to church on Christmas mm -hmm. uh, or Christmas Eve until I was a teenager. And, um, man, I think back on that and I go with the hindsight of 2020, Gosh, what was my mom feeling all those years, right? Mm -hmm. And and was there a place to put it? And so I think there's a lot of people that are in that category mm -hmm. that don't go to anywhere 
And so they're missing this opportunity to hear the story that actually is the hope that they need. So I hear a lot of that from people is people thanking us for that. Wes and I also last year, the local funeral home called us up and asked us if we would do a, um, they called it a remembrance service at the funeral home Mm -hmm. and where they had invited everybody that they had served in the last year to come to a worship service. And there were maybe 10 families came to that. But what I, you know, afterwards there was this reception and we had opportunity to just talk to these people and we weren't preaching the gospel so much necessarily. And I certainly wasn't doing what we do in our worship service in our blue Christmas, but these people came to that self-identified coming to that, that they were missing somebody and they were struggling. And it was powerful in that reception time afterwards to have people come to us, people from our community, people that were not churched, people um, that maybe have or do go to church, but they, their church doesn't offer something like this to come to us and say this, how important it was for them and how meaningful and helpful it was for somebody to let them name their sorrow. Mm -hmm. And um, we're actually doing that again this year. Um, that remembrance service for the local funeral home. And I called him. I was like, can I give you my blue Christmas stuff? And so we're, we're sharing that within the community. And my hope is that, that people in our community that may find themselves, maybe they are church, maybe they're not church, maybe they're believers, maybe they're not, but here's a church that's willing to kind of go against the stream and name something for them. I think that might be a powerful tool of outreach Mm -hmm. um, with the good news of Jesus at Christmas time. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that you mentioned in that was that some of your congregation members, you weren't, you didn't realize that they were grieving Mm -hmm. and that happens in our day-to-day life, not just at church. How, what is your advice for all of us just creating space within our own presence for to be aware of the grief of others, whether it's at church or just in life? Um, You know, I think that's all about relationship. I think that you got to be um, paying attention to people. And boy, at Christmas time, is it hard to put down your agenda and your distractions and to just pay attention, to pay attention in church to the person that is really quiet and is not smiling, um, to pay attention, maybe mark it on your calendar, the person that you know lost somebody last year um, so that you can reach out to them and think, to um, take the time to look at somebody and say, how are you really doing? Or how about, you know, why don't we go get a cup of coffee together? Or um, maybe after service, hey, why don't we go in here and we'll just sit down and visit for a minute? And I think to also be, if you are one of those people that feels that, and not everybody can do this. I recognize this, (laughs) that not everybody has the, the, the personality that will enable them to do this. But to take off your own mask. I think there's power in vulnerability because when one person is vulnerable, it kind of um, creates the space for another person to do that. Mm-hmm. I think um, that's one of the things I would just – because it's, a vulnerability is not a struggle for me personally. And I think that um, it that it opens other people to share vulnerably back what's mm-hmm. going on in them. And I think so part of why it's important that I share my own story of, you know, my dad died before Christmas. And my willingness to talk about that and to say, there's been plenty of seasons that I've just been sad. It en- it enables somebody else to crack open their nut and go, yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. And then you can have a conversation. But I don't think you can expect that to happen in a big group. That's always going to happen in the intimacy of one-on-one relationship. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think it's where if you have Stephen ministry, Stephen ministry can be very powerful and um and really a help to people but again uh, really it's relation it's relationship that makes a difference there yeah that's great what advice would you give to another church who's looking to start something like this for the first time well i think if you haven't been to one it's important to go to one right. i think cuz you then can get a sense of that so i think that's the first thing and certainly anybody would be welcome to come to ours um but i, I certainly think to go is a, an important thing the other thing i would say is um to be very intentional about the people that you ask to help you plan that kind of a service. You kind of need to ask the people in your community that um, either are familiar with the feeling and you know that they are, or that are sensitive to people in general, even if they can't personally identify, they can get in there and understand it a little bit. So you got to look for those sort of sensitive spirits among your congregation. And then I think you need to do something that's authentic to your community. And that's the biggest thing. I think that if you will do something that is authentic to who you are as clergy so that you can lead it out of a place that's real for you, um, 
and that's true to who your community is and what they're looking for. I think that's what's going to make it most impactful. Uh, go online and, you know, look around. And I really am a big believer in being, don't be afraid to adapt. If you see something you're like, I like this from this one and that from that one and this from this thing over here, okay, well, put it together and see how if you can make it all work together. And this is where having voices to kind of talk back to you is helpful to say, well, this worked and that this didn't work. We did it. This one was in this version of this was a new to us last year. And we actually had our praise team lead it, which would sound really counterintuitive because you're thinking it should be this, um, I don't know. It, you want it to be quiet. You're trying to create that atmosphere. So it was a slightly unplugged praise team thing. And here's the shocking thing. The first two songs we sing are absolutely not Christmas songs. What are they? Uh, the first song we sing is Come As You Are mm-hmm. um, because that song starts out, come out of sadness from wherever you've been, come brokenhearted, um, and let rescue begin. And so I think there's this beautiful invitation in that song um, that just sort of names. That song makes me cry every time I hear it because it names – that people are in a struggling pace. You certainly could find things like that in the hymnal. Uh, Come you sinners, poor and needy is a, would be a great one from the hymnal mm-hmm. to replace that. So we sort of started there and then um, we read a couple of scriptures. We named it and then um, we lit the Advent candle and um, that was really great. And then we read a passage from Isaiah, um, w- which really kind of was invitational to people Um And we responded with a psalm. And then we went to a true invitation. And the song we used was a song called I Rely On You. And if my husband were here, he could tell you who sings that, but I can't tell you that. Um, And the song I Rely On You and My Weakness You're Strong as Each Day New Day Dawns, I Rely On You. And so this invitation to cast your burdens on God, because the passage of scripture we read at that point was from Matthew. So um, where Jesus says, come to me, you are all you who are weary and heavy laden. And people need to be reminded, bring your stuff. Bring it messy. And it wasn't until they were praying that we started playing Christmas songs. Um, I think that was sort of a powerful thing because so many people have some specific memories around Christmas songs. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think you start with joy to the world and you're just, everybody's going to be out. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta lead people to it. So I think that that kind of stuff is important. Um, in, in planning a service. And then I think, go talk to somebody, you know, call your other clergy that are locally, maybe do a, you know, I'm from a rural community. I'd be hard for one little church to do this by itself. But, man, call all the little churches together and, and pull something together that becomes something for your whole community. That could be really powerful. And then you can have other voices. You know, if this isn't maybe – you might not identify with this personally as clergy. But there might be another clergy around the corner that is and that you can invite in to help you do that. And I think that would be really powerful. That's awesome. Is there anything else that we missed? Um, no. I, I, I think that – um. More than anything else, I think you need to remember that 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 piece of ending with some hope for people um, that doesn't make them feel like they got to leave, like feeling better. Like I don't know that I feel better, mm-hmm. like, but I do feel less alone, and feeling less alone is not nothing. And feeling less alone at Christmas, even if you're going to go out and you know continue to some of the things that you've been doing. Um, to not feel alone in it is really a powerful thing to know that you're not the only one that's sad. You're not the only one that struggles because here's the other truth. And I didn't mention this, but I think people are less likely to tell their immediate family when they're feeling that way. Mm. Like the last person that I'm going to tell I'm feeling lousy is more likely than not going to be my spouse. Cause I'm really feeling like, Oh, they're happy. And I don't want to be like their downer. And so I think maybe what you're going to find is that the people that are with you in it, they might not be your immediate family, but they're your your family in Christ and that together we share burdens. And so I think it's just really important. And I think that it's an opportunity, boy, a big opportunity for the church to share the good news of Jesus Christ at Christmas time um, in a way that is powerful and profound to people that most maybe need it, that feel the most brokenness in this season. That's awesome. Thank you, Tony Ruth, so much for sharing your story, your experience, and about your ministry. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, Melissa. And um, I hope you have a great Christmas. Thanks. You too. Thanks for listening to this episode of Means of Grace. To end our conversation with Tony Ruth on grief at Christmas, we want to share with you a portion of the worship service she references. I hope you'll take a few minutes to participate wherever you may be listening. And may you find moments of stillness and hope this Christmas season. The Gospel according to Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. 
In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. She wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger. The things we have written on these bands of cloth lying in this manger are our deepest wounds, our greatest sorrows. They are the burdens that we carry in these days of joy and mirth that make us want to shut the world out and hide under the covers until it passes. They represent our deepest longings, our great disappointments this season. And they can make us feel completely removed from the community, most often because we don't want to burden anyone with our misery in the season of lights. So we hear this Christmas story, and we imagine a holy night and a newborn baby, a bright star and songs of angels and gifts of kings, and our tears of sadness just don't fit in the picture. So we hide them, assuming there is not room for them in the manger. Tonight we offer you this word of truth. Jesus came for your tears, your burdens, your sorrows, and your pain. The prophet Isaiah writes in chapter 53, verses 3 through 4, He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. These words we associate with Good Friday are just as appropriate on this night because this is why he was born into the world, to bear our sorrow and our sufferings, to redeem our losses, to carry our burdens. He came wrapped in bands of cloth. Friends, he came wrapped in our sorrows. He came to love us and to comfort us and to wipe the tears from our eyes. He came for all the things that are written on these bands of cloth, and he wrapped himself in them to wrap himself around you and me and to remind us that we are never alone. Whatever burden you carry today, whoever it is that you're missing, whatever sorrows pull at your heart, I pray that when you see a manger scene and remember the baby Jesus wrapped in bands of cloth, You will know that your tears and your sorrow are the reason he came. He came to carry you. May that Christmas good news guard your heart and bring you deepest holy comfort and above all things hope in this season. Thank you for listening to Means of Grace, a podcast produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. We hope you've enjoyed listening to these podcasts and use them as a way to stay connected to our community. Remember to subscribe to Means of Grace for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave us an honest rating and a review. It helps others find this podcast. Follow the WNCC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WNCCUMC. That's WNCCUMC. Means of Grace is produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church and Gojo Studios.